<laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is April Akwashi, and I am a second year um, history graduate student at Johns Hopkins University. And welcome everyone to tonight's event, The Chorus Increases, Hartman in Translation. I'm here to introduce our panelists. I'm here to introduce our panelists for the evening. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say that it is an honor to have you here, Dr. Hartman, in conversation with Dr. Shilliam and Dr. Sumahoro. So our first panelist is Dr. Robbie Shilliam, who's an associate professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University, where he researches the political and intellectual complicities of colonialism and race in the global order. He's co-editor of the Roman and Little Ford book series, Quilombo, International Relations and Colonial Question, a co-founder of the Colonial, Postcolonial, Decolonial Working Group of the British International Studies Association, and a long-standing active member of the Global Development Section of the International Studies Association. Over the past six years, Dr. Shilliam has co-curated with community intellectuals and elders a series of exhibitions in Ethiopia, Jamaica, and the UK, which have brought to light the histories of the histories and significance of the Rastafari movement for contemporary politics. He also works with universal development of Rastafari to retrieve histories of the Rastafari presence in Baltimore and Washington, DC. Dr. Shilliam is currently working on two strands of inquiry. The first is a collective project to expose the abiding racial logics of the discipline of political science and retrieve and expand the anti-racist ethos of some of its less canonized practitioners. The second is a critical consideration of the free thinkers of the black radical tradition especially Rastafari intellectuals and their contributions to what we in academ academia call political economy. So welcome, Dr. Shilliam. Dr. Mab Mabula Sumahoro is our second panelist and she is an associate professor at the University of Tu and president of the Black History Month Association dedicated to celebrating black history and cultures. A specialist in the field of Africana studies she has conducted research and taught in several universities and prisons in the United States and France, and was most recently the inaugural Villa Albertine resident in Atlanta. Dr. Sumar Horo is the 2022-23 Mellon Arts Project International Visiting Professor at the African American and Africana Studies Department of Columbia University, as well as visiting faculty at Bennington College. She's the author of Le Triangle et l'Hexagon, Reflexion sur une identité noire, translated in English by Dr. Kayama L. Glover, entitled Black is the Journey, Africana the Name. The book received the Fetkan Marie Conde Literary Prize in 2020. Welcome, Dr. Small. And last but certainly not least is our guest of honor, Dr. Sadia Hartman. Dr. Hartman is a professor of African-American literature and cultural history, slavery, law and literature, and performance studies at Columbia University. She has been a Fulbright, Rockefeller, Whitney Oates, and University of California President's Fellow. Her many awards include the Guggenheim Award for the Humanities, which was awarded in 2018, and the MacArthur Grant, which was awarded in 2019. She is the author of the highly influential books, Scenes of Subjection, Terror, Slavery, and Self-Making in 19th Century America, Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route, and Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiment, Intimate Histories of Righteous Black Girls, Troublesome Women, and Queer Radicals, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism in 2019, and the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for Nonfiction in 2021. In addition to her books, she has published articles in journals such as South Atlantic Quarterly, Brick, Small Acts, Kalalu, The New Yorker, and The Paris Review. Dr. Hartman's work, which we have gathered here to celebrate, demands that we bear witness to Black lives, particularly the lives of Black women and girls who, who the archives have omitted or obscured, and to reveal moments, however fleeting, of beauty, refusal, and defiance. They are an invitation perhaps to join the chorus, an anarchy of colored girls assembled in a righteous manner and insist on their right to be seen and heard and remembered. Please join me in welcoming our panelists, Dr. Robbie Shilliam, Dr. Mabula Sumahoro, 
and our guest of honor, Dr. Sadia Hartman. So it's a, it's a great honor for me to um, facilitate this conversation. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm kind of nervous because I'm, I'm in political science and uh, I dabble in black studies and I dabble in history, so, but I dabble. Right? So, you know, I'm lucky I'm just facilitating. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to facilitate a debate between Dr. Hartman and Dr. Sumahuru. Um, and we, we're going to talk about um, a lot, hopefully, about... But, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I hate hearing myself, I please. Um, uh, translation, diaspora, all that kind of stuff. But the first question I wanted to ask both of you is, how did you find each other? <laughs> um, thank you, Robbie, for this uh, first question. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Minkalan, uh, Minka. Makelani, sorry, for this invitation. This is a great honor uh, to be here today. And I'm nervous too. I do black studies, Africana studies, but I'm nervous too. I even took my book with me, you know, just in case, just in case I need to find a quote that I will never find because I would be so nervous. So I could, would never, you get the point. Um, but I'm happy to be in conversation and honored to be in conversation with uh, Sedia, Dr. Hartman. How did I? How did we find each other? I um, I cannot speak in Sedia's place, but I can talk about how I found uh, Sedia and Sedia's work. So we've been talking a lot about the 25th anniversary of the seminal sins of sins of subject, um, subjection, but uh, sins of subjection is not the first book by Sedia that I read. I began with uh, Lose Your Mother. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. 25. Um, I began with uh, Lose Your Mother, and uh, I began with Lose Your Mother because it was advised to me by friends, uh, colleagues, people I was working with, and people to whom, as I explained uh, yesterday during our conversation, that I was going or that I was experiencing some type of academic crisis right after uh, the um, defense of my dissertation. I had felt that, uh, you know, this experience of um, of the PhD and not to discourage any of the graduate students um, <laughs> in the room, it is all worth it. But it had been such a difficult journey for me. It had also meant, and I think that um, that can begin our conversation about language. It was about um, during the, the PhD training, demonstrating the mastery of this academic jargon um, that had, um, I don't know, costed me a lot. That's all. So after all the effort uh, for uh, the dissertation, I could not, I could no longer write like the classical way. I was trying to, I don't know, return or find some other way to share the knowledge that we produce in in forms that, uh, I mean, in a language that can be intelligible um, f for others who are not trained as we are. Like, it, it's as if I was struck by the, you know, the elitism of this academic production of knowledge. So as I was um, you know, being a drama queen and, uh, and telling everyone, I, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, after, precisely after getting the PhD and after getting you know, the tenured position, uh, consistently, uh, people said, you should read Sidiya, you should read Sidiya, you should read Sidiya. So that took some time, but um, I began with Lose Your Mother, and um, that reconciled me with academia. Right. So this is how I found Sidiya. I mean, in a way, it's a kind of a funny um, story that I'll tell in relation to that point, because I think when I was writing scenes, I, uh, when I was writing Lose Your Mother, I actually thought, oh, should I leave the academy? Huh. And um, I was saying to friends, oh, you know, I think I want to be a different kind of writer. And 
maybe I should leave. And they were like, no, no, no. The easiest place to write a book is inside the university. I was like, okay, I'll stay. Um, but so, but, but I, so I understand precisely what you mean about, um, you know, modes of writing mm -hmm. and, and wanting to write in a mode um, in which more people can enter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I feel like I met you really officially, Mabula, um, in the context of uh, the Sojourner Project, mm -hmm. a Black Studies Mobile Academy, where we are thinking about, um, you know, the language and the conceptual framework to think about Blackness comparatively. And it was in our first iteration in Paris um, that we really had the chance to meet and to talk at length. Um, you know, I know you had curated film festivals in New York. It's hard actually to meet people in New York sometimes. So we, we met in Paris and that was wonderful. And then I had the, you know, the chance to actually write um, the introduction to Mabula's book. And, um, and I think reading that, um, you know, made me aware of how strong and how vibrant, um, you know, the critical resonance of certain kinds of diaspora questions are, because I had just finished Dion Brand's, um, you know, an autobiography of the autobiography of reading. And then I read, um, you know, your um, Black, um, uh, Black is the Journey. And, um, and I think that, you know, these intellectual interventions that want to undo a certain kind of training that want to, um, I guess, undo a script of colonial education. And so, and there were then these convergences between, um, you know, modes utilized in that, like how do you utilize a critical voice that is at the same time a deeply personal voice, um, an embodied voice, a, a voice that's actually rooted in social and historical experience. So you mentioned books, um, and and you're you've translated you're translating translated translated lose your mother translating. <laughs> um, what's the title going to be in French? <laughs> I do not know if I have if I if I can disclose the title, but maybe I will. But that's a question also for Cynthia because I'm taking a risk right now. Um, I have a question of your interpretation of your title. And the reason why I say that I'm taking a risk is that based on if, if, your, if your answer doesn't meet what I had in mind, then I have to retranslate the title. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll pretend that we never had this conversation, yeah. even though it's public. But, 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 so, so my question regarding the title is, what is this? you know, lose your mother. Is it to lose your mother, to lose one's mother? Is it an imperative? You need to lose your mother. You need to get rid of this mother. Or is it something else? A great question. Um, I, I think that there's something, um, you know, that's, that there's a question that's implicitly attached to that title. And it's about both um, you know, both a kind of like an imperative and a disavowal at the same time, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, because one doesn't want to lose mother, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, that title, which is borrowed from, you know, the, these kind of like letters that are crafted in the kind of diasporic exchange between, um, you know, young Ghanaians and African Americans, mm -hmm. I mean, part of saying lose your mother is to then to remedy it with the opposite. You lose your mother, but now you're here and you're back and I'm your brother. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's that. But for me, I was thinking um, also about rupture and a kind of constitutive mm -hmm. loss or mm -hmm. absence, right? Mm -hmm. And that that rupture and that constitutive loss um, is, you know, definitive of both, um, you know, the diasporic identity and what it means to, you know, I'm thinking just in the 18th 
17th and 18th century language, what it means to then find oneself as a member or something like a sable race. Mm -hmm. So there is this, um, this gulf, this breach um, that is constitutive and it seems that so much of diasporic writing, mm -hmm. you know, um, meditates on that breach, that gulf, that abyss, that break, that tear, um, and what has been engendered um, in its wake. I think it's also a way of pointing that there's, um, I mean, I wanna tread very carefully here because, um, you know, when we think about the enormity of loss and violence and the world making um, that happened in the wake of the Atlantic slave trade, I think we need pause. You know, so it's not, but then we're, you know, but then we have the Bob or Rita Franklin or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but there is then though what is, you know, engendered or yielded by a constitutive loss. Mm -hmm. And so there's also, so what is the remaking that um, occurs in the wake of that loss? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the, the things. You're not helping me. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> no, thank you. And why, why through the, um, the figure of the mother? Why through, you know, to yeah. lose your mother? It's not another family member. It's not a, it's the mother. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, I think the mother um, speaks to mother country, motherland, and also in the particular, you know, um, economy of you know slavery in the Americas, the maternal line as that um, that mark of enslavement, you know, on the child, what it means to be um, to be marked by the mother, both by her presence and her absence. And I think I was also thinking about you know other key moments, whether it's in a novel like Beloved, where um, Setha wants her, what is her mother's brand, but she recognizes it as her mother's mark on her. Mm -hmm. So that connection can be articulated or someone like mm -hmm. Jamaica Kincaid in Autobiography of My Mother, who's also, you know, really thinking about, um, you know, loss in the wake of the Atlantic slave trade and slavery, as well as indigenous genocide in the Americas, and that figure of the mother who's gone and lost, um, you know, carries the weight of that. Mm. So, um, so the mother seemed to be the figure. Yeah. So to answer your question, Robbie, um, it took me some time to, um, usually I uh, begin with titles and I, I, I find my titles very easily. So this wasn't my title, so, but it was uh, the most difficult part, no, one of the most difficult parts. So I began translating without translating the title. And um, I, I thought that maybe as I would make progress in the translation, something would come up, something would come up. But I, I wasn't I wasn't sure and it was uh, it was difficult. And I um after after some time, I have to say, I think I uh um I found it because I was drawn to the idea of you know mourning and loss and you know absence and presence. And uh, so I was wondering if I should keep the figure of the mother or if I in, uh, I should interpret you know that loss, that maternal loss, but that you know symbolic loss. And eventually I decided to keep mother. Um, so the, the title in, um, in French would be uh, A Perte de Mer, A Perte de Mer, which is, um, <laughs> that I can't translate. A Perte de Mer means lose your mother. <laughs> but A Perte de Mer means, um, perhaps somebody can help me in the audience. When you say in French, A Perte de Vue, for instance, because there's a, the title and the subtitle, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave, uh, route. So when you say a perte de vue, it means that um, everything that you can see uh, from a distance, but that like it never ends. How, can, how, how do you translate that in, in English? Horizon. Yeah, kind of an, a horizon, a perte de vue, like you don't see the end mm -hmm. of what you're looking at, wow. right? And so it's, I, I um, made up that, um, I don't know, 
that phrase, like the sight, the, the eternal sight of the mother, because mm -hmm. a perte de um, a perte de mer doesn't exist in French, and perte it means lose, mm -hmm. so it's it, it plays on the double uh, and tender of of, of lose. So, yeah. and also the the kind of the open time of what is lost. I mean, I think earlier, um, you know. Jessica was reading those lines and, you know, mm -hmm. lose your mother about the slave as, you know, the universal definition as being a slave and really thinking about lose your mother is also a, another way of speaking of the natal alienation. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, so that's how we um, experience it in its, um, mm -hmm. in its immediacy. Mm -hmm. All oh, right, and then there's the other book, right? We we saw the wrote uh, the the preface or introduction. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, my French accent. The triangle and the hexagon reflection on identity noir. Merci. Um, <laughs> I was asking for mercy. Um, but okay, so the triangle and the hexagon reflections on on a black identity becomes black is the journey, Africana the name. That's pretty different, no? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is different, it is different, but um, I have to say uh, that uh, I, I translated the title in English and uh, Kayama Glover accepted to work with that title. So I, I kind of imposed my title because this is how the book sounded to me in my mind. And I think um, this is a conversation that I had with some of the graduate students earlier today. Um, I think it, it takes us back to a reflection um, on audiences. When I write le triangle et l'hexagone, the triangle and uh, the tr triangle and the hexagon in French, I'm talking from France to France about uh, you know history, present the afterlife of everything, right? The afterlife of this history. And so, you know, the, the hexagon is a very common term uh, used in France to designate the French Republic, right? The French <coughs> nation. But the hexagon is a reference to the geography of France, but only to the European geography of France that is supposed to, to have six sides and, 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 and is the form of a hexagon. So you will, you, you will hear people use the term hexagon to designate France all of the time, it's common. Only when you do that, you negate and you leave out all the other parts of France that are not located within that hexagon and within Europe. And when you do that, this is how you get rid of the colonial history and of the slave history. And this is what allows the French, for instance, the hexagonal French to believe that there is no slave history for France, that slavery is a US matter or an American matter, right? Because of this separation dichotomy between European France and Atlantic France. To this day, it's not only about the colonial history. If we think of, you know, French Guiana, Martinique, Guadeloupe, uh, Saint Martin, all those, all those locations are still part of the French Republic. And if you turn to the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, you still have territories that are part of the French nation. So designating the way we do it very easily and very commonly, um, France as a hexagon is uh, um, reductive. So when I, I entitled my book, um, The Hexagon and the Triangle, the publishing house says that this is an obscure title. What I'm trying to address is the larger, um, you know, place that France occupies within, you know, like the, the Africana matters that I'm exploring. So, but the, the publishing house believes that the triangle is obscure. We don't know, we French people don't know about the triangle, right? So we negotiate and, um, you know, I keep my title and I have to eat to to add reflections on the black identity. Otherwise people, I mean, a potential buyers would think that it's about geometry. That's, that, that was the fear, right? So this is why I'm, I'm, this is what I mean by I'm in France 
I'm writing in French and I'm speaking to France. When there's a translation considered and when you're hoping for the, the book to travel and to travel in English, which is the language that I, a language that I speak, right? And um, if I'm considering context um, that began with the United States that I know well, I know, I mean, I'm hoping that I don't have to waste my time and explain what the triangle is. And uh, France um, disappearing through the hexagon, it doesn't matter. Using the hexagon in, in this context, the context of the US would be obscure, right? But it's, it, it also means that France does not matter. We don't have to particular, uh, partic make it particular. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I mean? I'm going to talk about you know, France, but it could be, it's France just like it could have been, you know, the UK, it could have been uh, Germany, it could have been Argentina, Brazil, and, uh, and all these things. So France can disappear. What cannot disappear is blackness and uh, the idea of diaspora, the motion, the, the, the circulations. So that's the journey, right? So black and, and diaspora needed to be kept. And um, it hit me afterwards, but I, I'm a big fan of... Um, Arthur J. Fa's work. And I've noticed that this kind of long titles is very reminiscent of, you know, um, love is the message, the message is death. <laughs> you know, our dreams are colder than your nights and all this. So it hit me afterwards. But, uh, and I also wanted to, um, to write something with beauty. Beauty, yeah. Style, <laughs> you know, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, I was going to just say two things in a response to that. I mean, um, just a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk and someone introduced me as someone who works on African-American slavery. And I was like, oh, does slavery belong to African-Americans? Like, and, and so that was like a similar way of, you know, containing these histories of empire and colonialism and the trade as if it's something like, you know, my ethnic cultural possession rather than a transatlantic process that has shaped capitalist modernity and created our financial institutions. But I was like, so, so that was like kind of the equivalent mood, um, you know, moved to that. I mean, I, I would also say, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about um, Mabula's work is thinking about, um, you know, these thematics or these um, storylines that are shared across the Atlantic, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel that there's, um, and this is why, you know, thinking of the book as an autobiography of reading was so important because really so much of your formation is through the work of a range of diasporic thinkers and writers in Africa and the Caribbean and, and in the US. And in that thematic, I mean, I think that the, the title of the book is very much related to, um, you know, to what has been kind of resonant in diasporic mm -hmm. thought for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So it, it also makes sense to me. And, you know, how do you tell your story from the specific location of France, but without it becoming bounded as a national story? Mm -hmm. Because it's not a national story. Mm -hmm. It's a story about the West as a certain kind of political project. Mm -hmm and the language of universalism that that project uses to disguise, you know, the kind of the violence and predation that has also produced, you know, the nation in all its glory. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. So there's a whole load there. And, uh, and I'm hoping we're going we're gonna to dig deeper. Um, so, so there you write about your, your grandfather coming from um, Curacao, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, Kerry. And what struck me about the essay that you um, the wrote, the, the Hold of Slavery, you know, yeah. recent essay on, on, on scenes of subjection. Um, when you look at the notes, you've got this massive overrepresentation of Caribbean writers. You've got Fanon, Winter, I'm trying to get them all, Patterson, Lisson. Jean-Marc uh, Jean Dash, Walcott, Brathwaite, Maurice Condé, and, and you've got a lot of African-American as well. But it, what struck me was the, the fact that there was a kind of over-representation um, in, in a reflection on a, on a piece, uh, on, on a historical writing, which is not bounded nationally, but, but the story is a, US. is a US story, right? And then, of course, Mabula. I mean, you know, you've got your, you, you've you've got that 
all the way through your life, that, that kind of um, translational thing, Cote d'Ivoire, France, the US. So is that, so I guess then the question is, is there any conception of blackness that doesn't already start with some kind of translation going? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question because, you know, I was actually describing another group of writers to someone and they said, oh, those are Caribbean writers. And I was like, oh, they're just like black writers to me. Do you know what I'm saying? And I think that, um, so I just think of them as, you know, the brilliant writers and thinkers who enabled us to grapple with our predicament. But yeah, I didn't, like, I don't, I mean, it's just interesting. I mean, even as they're so specifically, you know, Kincaid, Patterson, Rathway, they're just, they're a part of my essential architecture. So I think that so much of, you know, thinking about these issues of slavery, memory, dispossession, coloniality, I mean, so much of my thinking about history, I mean, it's Glissant, it's Trouillot, it's Morrison, it's, but so they don't have separate categories in my head based upon their locations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I totally agree. I think this also has to do with the essence or the, the nature, the essences or the natures of the diaspora um, that from its inception entails different locations, different locations. Like that's one of the basic rules when one in the social sciences, when one describes a diaspora not to be mistaken with a migration wave. Right? There's a departure following some disaster, a war, something. And there's a, a, de, um, a departure in at least two directions. It's not going from point A to point B, it's going from point A to point B and C and D and E to Z. You know. And it's having for the, the people in dispersal the knowledge that they are in dispersal, that one portion of the community is elsewhere. And that's the, the original home, the motherland, the, 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 the place of departure has been left behind, right? So from the very beginning, it's more than one. It has to be more than one. That, that's the diaspora, right? So I think it has taken me a lot of time that, um, you know, translation was at the center of these preoccupations. But um, over the years and decades, I didn't I didn't, um, I was not fully aware of that. You know, if I remember, you know, reading Brent Hayes Edwards and the practice of diaspora, um, I do not pay, like back in 2004, perhaps I do not pay enough attention to translation as a practice of diaspora that informed, uh, you know, the, the Martinican Nardal sisters who were based in Paris, France, and who were organizing and hosting literary salon at their house and hosting African-American artists of the Harlem Renaissance. And for them to welcome those artists or those intellectuals, it went through translation. And they were graduates from La Sorbonne and they were uh, graduating, I mean, they graduated from English studies. So they had the skill so they could perhaps talk to more people right, the, English, the French speaking world, the Creole speaking world, of course, but also the English speaking world. And that was back in the interwar period, translation from the very beginning. So even though I was aware of that for, for, for over, you know, like for almost 20 years, I, I, it's only today that I'm, I am translating, uh, I would say academically or professionally, right? But I think that uh, from the beginning, it is a matter of translation. I think this morning, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Carter, I, I believe, spoke about how, you know, like the challenge of trying to, um, I don't know, transcribe the idea of a breath on the page, right? That's translation, right? How do you translate experiences? How do you translate motions? How do you translate lives? And even though, you know, we can be in our respective uh, academic disciplines, it is all a matter of translation. And if you're interested, as we said at the beginning, in, um, I don't know, sharing 
your work or making it more accessible uh, of escaping the ivory tower, it's also translation, saying the same things, but in a language that can be understood, that becomes intelligible. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, agree with that. I mean, we are in motion. You, could, you can't write about like black radicalism in New York in the 20s and 30s without talking about all of the kind of Caribbean migrants who are in the city who are shaping that. And recently I was just, you know, looking at the movement of Jacques Ramon from, you know, from Haiti to Harlem around like the formation of the Communist Party in Haiti, doing work around the Scottsboro boys there. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're moving throughout the world. They're talking with one another. They're sharing ideas. They have a common practice. And, you know, um, you know, and I guess, you know, there is an imagination, I think, that kind of animates the diaspora and that, you know, one language for that has been about freedom. The other has been, you know, um, the end of, you know, empire or imperialism. Mm -hmm. And these are things that, you know, at one point in time, people thought were actually possible within the context of their own life. Like, oh, empire is going to fall five years from now. <laughs> so, so I think that there was just a kind of openness and vitality and a connection that was there that I think maybe we're more belated, um, we're like belatedly regarding in the scholarship, but the practice has always been that. And I think if I may, um, I think it also has to do beyond the imaginary. Um, it also has to do with personal lives. I know that in my case, from the very beginning, Ivory Coast and France uh, coexist. The French language and the Jula language coexist. And this is the same thing that Sidiya does in, uh, you know, in the very early pages of Lose Your Mother, is you know, the, the, the description of the anchorage in, in, in the south of the United States, but also a reflection on the immigration of the grandparents from the Caribbean. So that's, that's a fact. That's a personal, that's part of your, of your life. It's not something that you even have to, you know, explore, investigate, or read about. That's just a, what constitutes you. Right. So this is interesting because, you know, I was, I was about to, to push you guys towards difference, right? <laughs> but now I'm thinking, actually, no, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> so, like, so let me tell you what I was going to do. <laughs> So you, you, you both use words, um, obscurity, disguise, containment, boundedness, and, and, and you were talking about hexagon, right? Um, and and the, um, the UK is probably more similar to France than it is to US in, in, in that respect. Um, you know, all the bad stuff happened somewhere over there. Um, it never quite contaminated the high culture of the, the mother country, right? Um, you know, anybody who does like colonial archives, British colonial archives, there's always this, some administrator on some island heard drums last night. He's swigging some gin. He's really worried. He telegraphs back to, to London, you know, the natives are gonna go crazy and cut all our throats, uh, send some warships, you know, apocalypse, apocalypse. And then you've got the, the the dude back in London, you know, in 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 the government. Oh, Jenkins is losing his mind again. Must be the gin, you know. Of course, they're not going to do an uprising. You know, just send a, one warship just in case, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this it's this real utter separation, right? Um, which belies the fact that um, France is yeah, Algeria, yeah, yeah, which is a department, right? That the, that, that, that the UK has Ireland, right? And I was thinking about that difference with, with, with the US, right? You know, which is, the, which is the crazy place out there, you know, according to, according to Europe. But I'm, I'm thinking about what you, what you were just saying about this intrinsic um, movement and then, yeah, Puerto Rico, where, where, yeah, is, it, it isn't Puerto Rico, America's Algeria in, in, in a sense, right? So that then, when I was hearing you, I was thinking, okay, so then actually, what the issue is, or one of the issues might be, how nationalized narratives of blackness um, obscure some of the imperial 
roots of these movements. And, 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 and you know, I know that the US is not, it, it, it finds itself difficult to think of itself imperially, you know, whereas Britain and France would have, you know, taken it as a badge of honor, right? So I just wonder about this, because I thought it was different, but I'm thinking maybe, maybe it's not as different, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, you know, every place is the exception, right? And there are even people in this national context who will say, well, you know, I mean, slavery and settler colonialism, were, you know, they, those were deviations, but the, but the ideals mm -hmm. of democracy, the kind, those are pure. Those are not, you know, um, in any way um, shaped or impinged upon or thrown into, you know, crisis by these other histories. Um, I, I also think that in terms of, you know, the, you know, the state craft of racism, or when we think about, like, that's also global and that travels too. So we think of, you know, the US in relation to someplace like Nazi Germany, or basically the people who are in charge of, you know, the US occupation in Haiti, those weren't just Americans, those were like, the Southern architects of Jim Crow that then, you know, determine the terms of the project here. So I think that there is, um, that there is, there are these strategies of disavowal that are very, um, you know, kind of useful for imperial nations because then they require us to constantly do the work of proving and establishing the given, you know, proving and establishing what have been the constitutive conditions for the emergence and the supremacy of the West as a project, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, there've been all these paper, you know, articles on the cover of the New York Times, <gasps> democracies in crisis in the US, and, and it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's just like, so, you know, so on the one hand, the news is kind of declaring a crisis and that's actually such, you know, mm -hmm an enchanted ideological, you know, packaging of, you know, what this history has been. So I think that they're the particular variants of the way the US does that, the way the UK does that, the way France does that, the way Germany does that now. Um, but, you know. And I think that what the model of the diaspora offers, um, is, is, is perhaps another angle. And you know, this idea of globalism that uh, Sidiya has just mentioned, it, it is like to think in terms of diaspora and to use diaspora as a tool of analysis upsets all the national borders. It's, it's not about the borders. And I think that these national narratives, yes, it, uh, indeed can be trap. They, they can be traps, right? Because if you denationalize the narrative, then you see the similarities. You see that we are talking about one global system that has translated um, itself in multiple languages, but it's the same thing. It doesn't mean that it has, it has to be the exact same situation, but it's going to be about the same processes of racialization, marginalization, and you, you know, um, I don't know, gendering, all these things, it's the same, but spoken in the national language, in the national languages, right? So I think that this is why there is a, perhaps a very subversive um, dimension to this idea of diaspora, because, because those nation states do, do not make sense. They do not make sense. For in the life of the people part of this diaspora. What if your mother is one nationality and you, the child, you are uh, of another uh, you know, nationality? Are you still the, 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 the child of your, of your mother? Or are you, I don't know, French and, and uh, I don't know, American or you know, Brazilian? This doesn't make any sense. So, all right. So So let me do another kind of difference. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking of um, a, a word that, um, a, a phrase that um, 
um, Sadia uses about um, a temporal in, in the temporal entanglement, right, of abolition. So this, and, and you were saying earlier on, just pause, right? You know, it's not just yesterday and today. There is a temporal entanglement. Um, and then I was thinking about, you know, your translation of the title. It just, what, what's it again? It was, I think I'm terrible with language. <laughs> the title yeah, in the French. Title that you're gonna, yeah, the, <laughs> <laughs> the breaking news. A perte de mer. Right. A perte and, de mer. And it's the stretching of the horizon, but yeah. also. Yeah, it's the whole, like, well, a perte de, uh, the whole right, what you yeah. see, and which has no, no end. No end. Yes. So mm -hmm. it, 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 there's a similar kind of temporality that, to that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then I'm thinking of, of a definition of racism um, from, from you know, a, a very popular one from, from Ruth Gilmore. Racism is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. <gasps> so then the question becomes, um, in these diasporas, right, um, what is at stake in those who individually and familiarly have, have lineages back to enslavement and those who don't. And I don't mean that in a crass way. I mean, it, it, it does, is there a difference that that difference makes? Yeah. I think your question sounds um, more simple than it actually is. Um, because I don't know how to make the difference between those who have uh, you know, ancestry back to slavery and those who have not. Um, because of the archive and the missing archive, because of what's been, you know, remembered or forgotten, because of what has not appeared, you know, if you, if you let's say, we could say in theory that the diaspora, right, is linked, the, the diaspora of the modern, um, you know, age, is um, inherently connected to the history of the, the transatlantic slave trade, right? That's the, 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 the point of departure. But this diaspora is born out of the African continent. How can we know and count and pinpoint who was bereaved on the African diaspora? Who was uh, be, be beyond the people who actually left? And we know that some people did not leave the continent, but were displaced within the continent. You, you, you know what I mean? And so who was not impacted? So it's one way for the continent perhaps to imagine itself as having been preserved, but there have been consequences to this displacement and uprooting so who is not impacted? Who has roots in, in slavery and who doesn't, right? And how, the same thing applies if we think of colonialism. Is the African diaspora of the diaspora of the Americas not concerned by colonial issues when this colonialism is part or takes, follows suit of the, the history of slavery? And, and, and I think that that was a point, one of the points of realization that I had when I, I wrote the book, when I spoke about my initial look of, uh, you know, the diaspora of the Americas and, you know, talking about the, the 90s and the um, Erica Badu and Neo Soul and saying, you know, what is this performance of Africa, right? The African-Americans, yes, of course, of so the, the Blacks from the Americas, they have lost Africa. So they need to reimagine Africa. They are fantasizing. And I know Africa because Africa is my mother and I know my aunties and uncles and you know, my whole family, right? That, that, that was the theory, that was the first and wrong approach. But then um, uh, I realized that I'm just one generation away from Africa, but I'm still away. So it's just a, a chronological decalage and that we are dealing with the same thing. And I'm a product of colonialism when uh, others, scattered in the Americas are a product of more directly slavery. But it's the same story because we're all black in the world. We are all understood, perceived, dealt with, treated, mistreated as black people. And that is the common history. 
right? So I don't know um, who's in, who's out, who can be in and who can be out. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, there's a certain kind of framing of the question of reparations that's very much um, shaped by a legal um, an impoverished model of, you know, kind of, you know, tracing out causality and debt and who owes what. I mean, um, you know, there was a book, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, you know, <laughs> and so it, it's like right, we're talking about these, you know, historical processes that um, have differential catastrophic, you know, impact, right? Um, so, I mean, I think uh, and I think that there's something about, you know, um, how we are blackened, right? And I think that if, you know, I mean, Ruthie's definition is about this, like, you know, vulnerability to premature death. If we think about racism as the kind of the distribution of death across populations, well, once, you know, it doesn't matter who you are ethnically, once you step into the space of Fortress Europe, or the US, or even as you're imperiled and vulnerable in your home location, you're involved in that project of blackening, which is about an intense vulnerability and um, to premature death, to, you know, to forms of predation and extraction. I mean, one thing, you know, a shield in the critique of black reason, I mean, I don't know that I agree with it, but he makes, you know, this point in really trying to think about the way in which, you know, black people are the emblem for fungibility mm -hmm. and what's happening in late capital is that that position is being democratized yes. so larger people are being you know blackened by these processes of like war and extraction and accumulation but i think it's important to hold on to the the you know the structural analysis rather than um you know these kind of variants of you know cultural difference and um, notions of, you know, what is owed that are totally within the framework of, you know, state notions of justice or reparations, because we want more than that anyway. All right, question of method. <laughs> question of method. Um, you said the magic word. Decollage. <laughs> um, and um, so I'm thinking about critical fabulation and I'm thinking about that, that um, phrase that you said with regards to decollage about, how, you know, how do you translate a breath on a page, right? Mm -hmm. it? Yeah. So Brent Edwards' work is about print culture, right? Um, and it's incredibly useful with the decollage, right? You know, the, you, joint, you know, the joints, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but it is print culture. Um, and so I wonder if, if um, critical fabulation is the same kind of practice as the practice of diaspora. Well, you know, I think I don't understand decollage to be confined to print culture. Mm -hmm. I think it is about what that practice is and when, you know, you know, the connection, the separation, mm -hmm. the diasporic friction mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a part of our coming together. Mm -hmm. um, I feel, um, you know, I feel that critical fabulation is more method and it's a it's a way of trying to um i mean some might say to kind of you know decolonize the episteme um uh I, and I, I once heard like fred moten say something about like i don't want to read the violence of the archive i want to do violence inside the archive so maybe critical fabulation is also a way of like doing violence inside the archive but it seems that it's um that it's a way to, um, to elude um, and to weaken and to destitute certain um, structures that um, determine what we can say and know and the ways we can say and know. And, and I think that it's simply, it can also simply be a, a practice of freedom, 
an attempt at, you know, radically practice freedom in the form, trying to render freedom, trying to access freedom in a structure that, that simply denies you, you know, that freedom and that reality and that um, those truth about human beings and human uh, you know, lives. So I think that um, it's just a way, you know, critical fabulation, perhaps a manner in which you can make an intervention on your own terms. You can make an intervention, not to prove, not to make a case, not to hope to gain because you, you have a, a, an awareness of, of history, just to be and to be the way you want to be or the, the way you are. Uh, it's just, it, it can be, a, it's a tool, but as you know, practice of, of um, and in that it's very ra radical of, of freedom. You know that um, the discipline and the disciplines do not work in your favor. That's, that, that's the basis. So what can you do? What can you do? And I, I just want to echo that. I mean, that's a great point because that's part of Ferrer de Silva's toward um, a global idea of race. Even the critique of Black people, it's about the way our, our tools for thinking the world are, you know, shaped and, you know, infused by the structures of racism and coloniality that we're trying to think against. Mm -hmm. So we have to do something with those tools mm -hmm. in order to, um, you know, some we need to cast away, we need to make some new tools. Mm -hmm. And early, in the earlier panel, people were talking about inventing method, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we become less and less, you know, faithful to the kind of the protocols yes. of, knowledge production as organized by these kind of regimes of knowledge, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. disciplinary regimes. Yeah. So when, when we're talking about decollage um, and, and or critical fabulation, and we're talking about it with the diaspora, mm -hmm. is the fundamental um, joint black and African? Um, <laughs> because it's a deep question. Um, I don't know what at Africa is. Africa is my problem, my intellectual problem. I don't know what Africa is. I was going to ask you. I was going to say what is because I, I feel like I know what something black is. Yeah. Because I feel like it has a history and a structure mm -hmm. and, but. You know the the African the Afri that's the more unwieldy part of it. Yes, yes. And to to me, that's a very complex question. And what has mm -hmm. Africa been? What is this convenient umbrella term that we keep using, that we keep dreaming about, that we keep fabricate fabricating? But what is it in reality? Um, what is uh, isn't it the the only place in the world that is designated so so lazily and easily I, I never hear about Asia uh you know um uh being designated uh you know that lightly you let alone Europe let alone you know the Americas right or other places but Africa is simultaneously convenient and unreal um is it the geography is it the continent uh, is it this mass of land? Is it an idea? You know, the idea. Is it an invention? Um, what is an African? And I'm the first one to use the term all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if we, we, we take the time to think about that, to ponder that, what, what, you know, Africa is, is the problem. <laughs> That's the problem, this, this Africanity that has been invented when people who, you know, even in the um, ancient times, it, uh, even during antiquity, the, 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 the term was not like there was Ethiopia, for instance, for the, for, for the Greeks, but Ethiopia was, was, uh, could designate the entire continent, but it was also designating what later on become Abyssinia. So there was 
the awareness, the knowledge that it was, it was a land of, of, of uh, multitudes. You, you know what I mean? And so, and if we are talking about the transatlantic, I mean, that transatlantic moment, the people who left did not understand themselves as Africans, right? I don't know. <laughs> And so is the, you know, like the, 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 the joint of departure, mm -hmm. African and Black. I, I can only say that the two, the two terms do not designate the same identities and that, um, uh, you know, African and Black do not, do, yeah, do not point to the, the same realities. Um, I don't know if we need a hierarchy um, we are still talking about, you know, like the bottom of the hierarchy too, too. but Africa is the, um, is the land of savagery um, that at times Blacks from the diaspora have been able or have been willing to understand themselves as evolved Africans. Yeah, <laughs> you're naming names. I'm not naming it, but you know what I'm saying? This evolution, this access to, you know, Christianity, literacy, Western world, and, and so sometimes I find the, the label African below the label black, you, you know, that it makes me just to, to finish. When we, uh, there's a conversation that we had with Seti uh, not too long ago. In French and in France, sometimes people cannot say the word black to designate black people. And that's something I, I forgot to mention. They will say black in English. They will oh. talk about un black, une black, right? Yes, because we're colorblind and we, so it's so foreign to us that we have to resort to a, a foreign language. <laughs> but I think the, the, the thing that I did not mention last time is that when using that term black, it's usually in my view to designate actually like black French people, indigenous black French people. If you're talking about Africans, recent immigrants or visibly Africans or traditional clothes, the French, would never naturally use the term black. They will say African. You know what I mean? African is something else. You know, it can be about the, you know, the head wrap and the, you know, the, the wraps and the, 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 the dresses. And they will say African. They would never designate these, um, you know, communi uh, communities as un black. Now, black is oh, the invisibility of the indigenous black people from France. We don't like we don't know what to make of you. You're no longer an African. You're not part of us, and you're here. So let's use English to designate you, right? But but African is something like Africans. African is less than black, in my view. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to say yeah. Um, I was going to say one thing, just in terms of though that imagination about Africa. I mean, that was also something that you know African thinkers and philosophers were also trapped in that bind too. Um, that you know, what is it? Um, Huntanji who says every discourse about Africa is about its conversion and transformation. So even when you look at like early like 19th century, 20th century Black intellectuals, um, African intellectuals. Black intellectuals on the continent, they're also, you know, um, they're, they're struggling with the same, you know, epistemic enclosure mm -hmm. as diaspora so are, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's about the, the language of intellectual mm -hmm. life and what those frameworks are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes it's, yeah. So, it's right, true. so it's not like you have an advantage because you're in Senegal versus being in Martinique. Yes. No, it's the same. Yes. It's the same formation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Minka, you Hi, um, thank you all so much. This has just been such a crazy day of learning for me. Um, we're so lucky to have you here. Um, so both of you spoke a little bit about 
diaspora as a tool of analysis. And I want to ask about diaspora as diaspora um, and is the fact that we are just even here um, and we can identify ourselves as diaspora, can that be a subversive force in itself? Um, yes, it can be, it has been, it has been thought about. This is the, you know, this is the Pan-African, you know, ideal, um, but, um, then there has been the there have been the realities of this desire to actually to operate beyond national borders, and and doing that being so I mean meaning being so subversive, truly reveals what is at stake. If you if you are challenging the model of the nation state, uh, of course you're not going to. Um, be let's say granted the permission to continue your activities freely because this is really threatening right you can understand yourself as a diaspora you can try to you know develop um you know forge solidarities and and and, and uh, contacts throughout borders but but then the respective nation states will have something to say and we're talking about the survival of the nation states and those nation states did not come into being for no reason. I mean, there's a vested in interest in their, you know, continuity. So yes, that's the possibility and the problem. Long live the diaspora. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, so thank you so much. Um, this has been a fantastic talk. Um, I've really appreciated pretty much every word. Um, and I have a similar question on the basis of, um, in the academic context, I feel like diaspora as a term is possible to use only as a tool. Um, as something that is taken or left when someone's doing an analysis. Um, whereas I feel like in my like actual reality, it's, it's impossible to think in a way that I um, am comfortable with without incorporating that. Um, and so I guess my question is about the academic like methodology of thinking without diaspora. Like, what does that look like? Think without. Um, it's boring. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's even possible, you know, because, um, you know, because even with something like Scene, to me, that is a book that's definitely thinking about and based in the US, but I, but I can't not talk about forms of West African practice. I can't not talk about um, memory of loss. I cannot not talk about womb abyss. So, it, and again, it's not that I think like, oh, I have to use the tool of diaspora mm -hmm. just simply to describe what I'm trying to describe. I'm all, you know, I'm in that space. So I feel in a way that I almost came like belatedly to diaspora to even understanding myself as a part of a diaspora. I mean, I grew up in a Black community in New York with friends from Panama, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Birmingham. You know, we didn't think of ourselves as like a diaspora. We were just like Black girls, you know? So I think that, you know, what the conceptual framing, um, you know, enables is maybe a, a kind of politics, a kind of analytics, but we were, we were living, were we living diaspora? You know, we were like living together, but not in this like frame of, um, you know, we didn't have a diasporic, you know, consciousness. And even as I began writing, you know, Lose Your Mother, I mean, I, I, I didn't think at all, you know, and I had read French, I wasn't like, oh, I'm writing a book about diaspora. I was like writing a book about 
the slave trade and its legacy. And as a part of that, then all of these issues of difference in diaspora and Africanity and just, you know, the incredible, um, you know, all of the kind of contradictions and antagonisms that are shaping that space of Africa, right? I mean, you're right, like when someone like James Scott is writing about peasant societies in Asia, we understand there are great state formations there, peasants, there are people who are living in the hill. It's not the notion of this monolithic, um, you know, homogenous thing, right? And so it was a lot to work through the multiple, um, you know, the multiple fields of differentiation mm -hmm. that one has to work through to think diaspora and to continue to think diaspora in the context of Africa. And I think that that was a really interesting, um, you know, to wrestle with. I mean, someone, uh, Joseph Miller in Way of Death, I mean, he, you know, also talks about all of the internal languages of diaspora that are produced in the African context as a result of the Atlantic slave trade. So that was also interesting for me to, to be experiencing those diasporic formations on the continent too. Like, oh, there are people here who are also fleeing from uh, slave traders and raiders who are re renaming themselves, who are remaking their identities, who have this kind of relationship of struggle to centralized states. Um, and it's not that diaspora alone can give an account of that. And perhaps to elaborate on what I said earlier, like what, what I meant by it is boring um, to operate without um, diaspora is because it limits things. Um, and if you look at individual and collective trajectories, Leaving out that the, the, the possibilities that this tool allows would mean limit, um, you know, the attention paid to that particular group or that particular person in one, um, how can I say, only in, for one moment in their life when they're in motion. So I think it's, it's also the, the, the respect of the, the humanity, that is to say the complexity and the multitude again. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, one of the monuments, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, you can locate him in the, you know, uh, you know, in U.S. history, African-American history, right? But what do you make of his, you know, uh, German years? What do you make of the fact that he's buried in Ghana? That, that's just a fact. So I think I do understand what you said about, um, you know, like the, the discomfort, for instance, because that's why it's not... It, it, as a tool, it's not easy to manipulate. It's not easy. And, and that's, that's the struggle. Like we have to find ways that the method uh, can be, <laughs> you know, perhaps messy and everything, but that, that, that's the difficulty, right? And, and the last thing is that, that the diaspora is not a, it's not a position. It's not only like a, a political, even a position. It's just the description, the description of a reality. It's not an opinion, it's just a fact. It's a fact. It's not, uh, I'm in favor of diaspora, I'm not in favor of diaspora, you know? It's just a fact. Diasporas exist, right? And people within those diasporas exist and navigate. And what can we learn? Um, and I think that the more complex it is, the more chances we have to get closer to some, you know, you know, truth, reality, justice, and all these things. Thank you so much. I, I just wanna shout out everyone who's here, everyone who's in the Zoom room. It's wonderful to be part of this gathering. I love your work and so do my grad students. And on their behalf, I wanted to ask if you have any advice or words of encouragement for younger scholars who might be working against the silence of the archive and working against disciplinary norms and trying to find their voice. Um, in environments which are often unfriendly to them, do you, what would you say to the, the younger people in the room who are the future of our fields? <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say just um, really to, to follow your heart, to, to follow that instinct and intuition. Um, and I, I also think that 
there's a way that the, the crisis of the humanities has inadvertently created a kind of space uh, for working differently because, um, you know, I mean, publishers and literary publishers are not producing that, you know, that monograph. So I think that, um, that doing interesting work um, that is driven by passion and is trying to expand how we, you know, know the world or understand it. I mean, keep doing it, you know, keep doing it. We don't need to kind of replicate the forms um, in which knowledge has already been, um, been given to us. So I would just encourage them. All right, so let's give our guests a hearty round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, one last word, and I know it's been said repeatedly today because we're here to celebrate Sidiya's work, but I just wanted to say publicly, Thank you. Thank you for your work and the, the scholarship. And we, 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 we've been, we've discussed abstract, thi abstract things, but it, they can, it can be very real and it can be very pivotal in, you know, the life of an individual, including myself. So thank you so much for your scholarship. Yes, we just want to make a couple of very quick announcements. Uh, so let's just... just really quickly, um, again, this is a, a collaboration between JHU, Africana, and the Diaspora Solidarities Lab. So to learn more about the Diaspora Solidarities Lab, go to dslprojects.org. Um, and there you can find our contact page, sign up for our newsletter, keep up with all kinds of events. If you're away from here, we have all kinds of events that are virtual that are streaming like this. So please do stay in contact. Um, coming out with us in the virtual land and uh, thank you all for being here.